him who saves us by his blood. Let us put down roots to eat water. Let us drink from the fountain of life. And we shall be like trees planted by the waters, planted by rivers wide and deep. Trees green and fruitful, bearing fruit of love in the vineyard of the King. Come, let us grow in the grace and knowledge of God's Spirit by which we're sealed. Studying the riches of his word, let us eat of the bread that he gives. And we shall be like trees planted by the waters, planted by rivers wide and deep. Trees green and fruitful, bearing fruit of love in the vineyard of the King. Come, let us grow in the grace and knowledge of he who calls us by his Son. Let us gather now at his table. Let us feast on the richest of food. And we shall be like trees planted by the waters, planted by rivers wide and deep. Trees green and fruitful, bearing fruit of love in the vineyard of the King. Goodman, Sam. Yes, it's time for us to grow. Good evening, Sam. It's time for us to grow. And a good midday to you as well. It's time for us to grow. <laughs> Are we ready for today's lesson, for today's devotion? We're just a couple of minutes early, but so we'll wait for people to kind of join us. Ezra's doing tagging, I think, at the background there. He's out, he's trying to find my book. Which O'Shea moved last night. It should be with my Bible. Huh? Yes, I know it's good evening. I just figured I'd cover all the bases. <coughs> it's Friday. You know, it's Friday. Just uh, by way of covering the bases, tomorrow's uh, Psalms will be 98 through 101. If you want to write those ones down, Sam. So that'll be Psalms 98 through 101 will be what we'll be covering uh, tomorrow during devotion. Good morning, Sister T. How you doing? Hit a home run. Jesus, the heavenly batter. That was quite a clatter back there. That's okay, Sister T. We'll give you a couple minutes.
I'm doing uh, okay this morning. Rather tired. Um, slept kind of lousy last night, but I'm okay. Sam's got sinus troubles. Come, let us grow in this race and knowledge of He who called us by His Son. Earworm. <laughs> Oh, Shay and Amos just left for work here uh, just before I went live. It's going to be an interesting day. I get to, um, this afternoon, go down to work, and um, I get to go ride, get to meet our new director of transportation, um, for the obviously for the first time, because uh, I get to meet him. But... I also get to uh, I get paid to run my route, show him show him my route. So good morning, Heather. Uh, no, basically, I think he's going to, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know how we're going to do it, whether I get to drive him around or whether he drives and I point the way, but either way, hey, it's an extra hour or so of, of, uh, uh, work, um, get paid for it. So maybe I get route pay, which is two hours of work. <laughs> So that'll be interesting. But I, I look forward to it, uh, to meeting the new guy. Um, I, every, every year I look forward to going back to work. Um, I love my job. And uh, if, if I had found bus driving before I went back to college for my uh, bachelor's degree, I would never have gone. Um, this will make my 13th year driving. Bye, Shua. I look forward to seeing how the kids have changed over the summer. I don't know. I might get some new uh, new kids. They may change my route a bit. I don't know. It's always uh, it, it it's different, and I like that. I don't want to work for the Metro for a couple of reasons. Um, one, 
It is over an hour to drive to get to work. And two, it's running through the middle of the big city. And I'm, I'm not a big city driver. Um, school bus, I'm dealing with kids. Metro, you're dealing with adults who can't, uh, adults who haven't, have not grown up. There's a big difference. Or should I say adults who know better? However, um, if I do take a different type of bus driving, uh, there is what they call um, a transit around here. And what that is, is basically you're, you're, you've got a um, kind of a short or a mini bus and you drive senior citizens or disabled people um, around to do things like grocery shopping or go to uh, uh, doctor's appointments, etc. And I wouldn't have a problem doing that. Uh, I've got a we've got a dear brother in Christ who does just that. Uh, after he retired. He decided to he, he decided to use his time and uh, huh. decided to use his time to uh, more better effect and he just he took up a job driving for one of the transit companies and doing that. It'd still be like a half hour drive for me to get to wherever um, a bus is. Um, for something like this, but. But it'll be fun. It'll be fun anyway. Waiting for my tech person to come in. I think she's about ready. I need some uh, water, my dear. Let's go ahead. Uh, good morning, Laura. How are you doing? Don't worry. Um, Sister T, are you back yet? All right, she is back, it looks like. We are going to uh, begin our do lesson 141 today in the I Grow Daily Devotional written by Philip Johnson, produced by Focus Press. There is a link in the chat, or rather in the, in the uh, description of the video, one scrolling across the bottom of your screen. And there is or shall, shall be one in the chat screen here in just a couple minutes. Um, as Alicia gets ready to uh, um, put it there.
Mr. Mud Dauber's flying around. So, we've got Sam, we've got Heather, we've got Laura, we've got Sister T. Not necessarily in that order. I think it actually went Sam, Sister T, Heather, and then Laura. But who cares? Who's counting the order, right? We have you here, and we're glad to have you here. And we have a lurker or two in the background as well. Let's begin by putting one minute on the clock. Alyssa, where are we at there, sister dear? Have you got the link in the chat yet? You do? There it is. Okay. So let's go ahead and take the banner off as we put one minute on the clock. The ticker. We are going to devote that minute to meditating on the following words as you look forward to heaven. Hold to the hope, the belief, the conviction that there is a better life, a better world beyond the horizon. Let's meditate on the, those words. Hold to the hope the belief, the conviction that there is a better life, a better world beyond the horizon as you look forward to heaven. Somewhere the sand is put four minutes on the clock as we devote these four minutes to reading John chapter 12. John chapter 12. When then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he, <coughs> or Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? And, verse 5, given to the poor, verse 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag, and bear what was put therein. Verse 7, Then said Jesus, Let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always have ye with you, but me ye have not always. Verse 9, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted 
that they might put Lazarus also to death. Because by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Verse 15. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain... You, went, you skipped a verse too fast there. Go back to verse 20. There you go. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Now verse 21. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man shall, or if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. There came a voice from heaven. Then there, came, there, then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake unto him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out and if i be and i if i be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me this he said signifying what death he should die the people answered him we have heard out of the law that christ abideth forever and how sayest thou the son of man must be lifted up who is the son of man Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Verse 36. Liz is eating her breakfast, that's why it's taking her a little bit longer. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our reports, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 39. Therefore they could not believe, 
because that Esaias said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, because, uh, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogues. Or synagogue. Verse 43, For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. Ooh, me. And the, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. John chapter 12. We're going to put four minutes on the clock as we devote our time to reflecting on the answer to these four questions. Question number one. Read verse 27. Let's see, take us back to verse 27. What does this verse reveal to us about Jesus? Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? The Father saved me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. What does this verse reveal to us about Jesus? Morning, Sister K. Question number two. What did, or did Jesus want to suffer and die on the cross? What motivated Jesus to go through with this? Did Jesus want to suffer and die on the cross? What motivated Jesus to go through with this? Combine. Oh, no, nope, didn't see it. Question number three, what is your purpose as a Christian? What is your purpose as a Christian?
Question number four, what do we learn from Jesus that will help us fulfill our responsibilities to God as his children? Give me just a couple, uh, just a minute or so to finish up answering. These are some really good questions today, aren't they? Some really deep ones. Thank you. Would you bring me my uh, pencil off my clipboard? And a sheet of paper, blank paper, because I've got an idea that I want to write down. Question number one, when Alicia gets back. Thank you. All right, question number one was, read verse 27, what does this verse reveal to us about Jesus? Thank you, Sister T. We appreciate it and we need it. It didn't rain last night, though it smelled like it was going to. Kay says, Jesus does God's will. Um, I 
what this verse, like that K says, what this verse shows is Jesus' total commitment to God's will. His total dedication to his purpose. Father, save me from this hour? No, but for this cause came I unto this hour. This is, this is the whole reason I came. Answer number two. He does God's will. He was scared. We see his humanity and his fear. I like how you put the, la the, the middle part there, um, Sam, because what this verse really shows us is that he was human. Now is my soul troubled. Was there fear in that? Possibly. Looking forward to the crucifixion, knowing what he's going to go through. Um, his soul is worried. His soul is anxious. When it says, my soul is troubled, uh, there's a little bit of fear in there. But there's obviously more in addition to it. For he says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Nah. It's for this cause I came to this hour. One could say, one, I can see his soul at war. There's two sides. Yeah, but we haven't got to answer three yet, Sam. <laughs> answer, oh, he wants us to go on to answer three. Uh, answer three. Teresa was asking his father to save him. Um, no, what, is, what he's doing is posing a question. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Should I say, Father, save me from this uh, hour? But why? It's for this cause that I came unto this hour. So Jesus is not saying that he should say this. He's drawing a point. And the point concludes in verse 28. He's like, okay. My soul is anxious. My soul is worried. My soul is troubled. Uh, should I say, and, and what should I say? Should I say, Father, save me for this hour? But here's the reason, uh, but this is the whole reason I came to this hour. So I should say, rather, Father, glorify thy name. And the boy and God answers him by saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So it's not it's not the, the case of um, Jesus asking for salvation or to be saved from this this hour. We know that he knew what was coming. We know that he was um, very, he was rather hmm. it's kind of like when you were a child and you'd done something wrong and you knew your dad was going to meet out punishment you knew what was coming And you knew you couldn't escape it. <laughs> Not that Jesus was uh, 
um, had ever done anything wrong and was going to be punished. But it's that same feeling. You knew what was coming. You knew you couldn't escape it. Heather said Jesus knew beforehand that he, what he would have to suffer. He did. He's known, he knew this all the way at the beginning when he created the world. He knew what was going to happen. This was the eternal purpose. This was the eternal plan. So rather than seeking salvation from that hour, from that time, and from the pain, the anguish that he was going to have to bear, he rather sought God glory he was dedicated to the purpose to the plan remember we talked last night during evening edification about how um, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient even unto the death on the cross well here we see this Jesus obedient to the will of God he knew what he was going to have to suffer same thing for us, you and I. If we are following Christ, we know what, that, that we may end up suffering for it. We may indeed. There are going to be people that persecute us. But it's better for us to suffer that persecution for Jesus' sake rather than for for uh, something we ourselves have done. Next answer. Oh, wait a minute. We did Kay. We did Sam. We did uh, Sister T. And we did Heather. Okay, we covered them all. Uh, answer uh, question number two. Did Jesus want to suffer and die on the cross? What motivated Jesus to go through with this? Heather says, love for the Father and mankind. If we were to back up a verse or two, um, notice what Jesus is talking about in context. Lissy's got us there. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be. If any man serve him, or if any, let's see here. If any man serve, I can't see it because of the, uh, um, question and answer 26 if any man serve me him will my father honor now is my soul troubled what did Jesus do Jesus exemplified his teaching he didn't love his life more than the will of God he was ready to lose his life. Did Jesus want to suffer and die on the cross? Well, no. But he was ready to lose his life for God's will. Answer number two. Love for the Father and mankind. That's what mold motivated him through it. Specifically love for his Father. How many times did Jesus come through and say, I come to do the will of my Father? Um... In verse 44, Jesus says, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that seeth me. Or sent me, rather. He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. 
I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. What is it that motivated Jesus? The will of God. Obedience to the command of God. Love for the Father and for mankind. Did he want to? No. And yes. He wanted to because it was the will of the Father. That's the only reason he wanted to. That's the only reason he wanted to. Answer number three. Cases, no, he didn't. But his love for us and oneness with the Father motivated him. Exactly. His oneness with the Father. His, his unity. And since he was one with the Father... He loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Next answer. He had a hard time with it, but uh, it was the Father's will, and it was he went, he was going to draw all men to him. <clears throat> Just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Christ was going to be lifted up. Just like. rather busy today and just like all the men that were wounded in the wilderness looked under the serpent so shall all men look unto Christ there isn't going to be an excuse if you reject the words of God of Christ you are rejecting God and if you reject God then there is only one course for you. It's like we talked last night. You are either going to yield yourselves to sin or you're going to yield yourself to God. There is only two choices. It is that stark. Uh, it is that black and white. You are either going to yield yourself to God or you are going to yield yourself to sin. No man can serve two masters. It's impossible. Is there another answer for uh, question two, Alicia? <clears throat> Tree says, no, he didn't, but it was his father's will who sent him, right? Again, we look and hearken back to Jesus' own words. Uh, I come to do the will of him that sent me. Uh, we also look at uh, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. We see um, Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And becoming him, being obedient unto death on the cross, he became the author unto, of eternal salvation unto all who believe him or all who obey him, rather. <clears throat> so it's that simple. 
No, he didn't. And yes, he did. Because there again, we look and we say, he, the reason he wanted to was because it was the will of his father, plain and simple. The human side, recognizing the pain and the torture that was going to be put on him, was troubled. Question number three. Sorry, Mickey. What is your purpose as a Christian? Sam says, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. To serve God. Answer number two. To bring to God glory to God and to seek and to save the lost as Jesus did. To be a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. First John chapter 5 verse 3. Answer number 3. Teresa says to serve God and bring as many as I can to heaven. But I really want to make God proud of me. At the end of the day. We seek. As, as, a, as a child, we seek to please our Father. Do you remember the joy you felt when you took some little drawing or some little thing to your father? Your, your earthly dad, and he praised you, and he was, oh, that's really great. Do you remember that feeling? How about the feeling that you instilled in your child when you did that, when they brought you such a little trinket, some little thing that they had done? And how when you do that, they just wiggle and wriggle and squirm in a delight. There you have an image of what we, as a child of God, seek to do. Ultimately, we are only unprofitable servants because we've only done exactly what he wanted us to do. But in doing that, we please him. And isn't that what we desire? Is there another answer, Alicia? Yes, the birth of your children is a very precious feeling. To bring this life into the world is a deep and profound feeling. As a father... The first time that I held O'Shea in my arms after he was delivered, it's like the deepest of joy. I could not, I couldn't comprehend the, the uh, 
wealth of emotion that went through me at that moment to look at this precious little life and realize that I had had a part in bringing this life into the world. But at the same time, as I looked upon him or Amos, Ezra, Alicia, Shua, I recognized the weight of responsibility that was now placed upon my shoulders in that instant. Because God had entrusted me with these precious souls to raise them up, to teach them his way, his will, to prepare them for a life of their own, to protect them. And I worry, uh, and the amount of worry that also coursed through, because worrying about what kind of a future would they have, yet knowing that if I did this right, if I raised them up in, under uh, the nurture and admonition of God, that it really didn't matter because God would take care of them. Our language is so inadequate to explain that feeling, is it not? Proud, proud doesn't even begin to come close. Joy, love, that doesn't even begin to come close. To what I felt in that instant. What do we learn from Jesus that will help us fulfill our responsibilities to God as his children? Heather says that his submission to the Father's will. Jesus in all things submitted his life. Submitted his will to God. It was never about Jesus' will. We, uh, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago now, uh, we dealt with, we dealt with how um, Daniel, from the very get-go, this youth of a man, purposed in his heart to follow God, to dedicate himself to God. And as such, it was never about his own will. It was about remaining true to God. Answer number two. Jesus was the same way. He always kept his will in submission to God's. Basically what Heather said, says Teresa... Question number, answer number three, that we need to stay in the light and the Father and the Son be with us. We need to show our light uh, to the world because we are God's special people. We need to teach. Uh, Alicia, can I please finish the comment? We need to read, teach, and show God to a dying world. How did you get that all from this chapter, uh, Sam? <laughs> and answer number next
wholeness of self toward God. Yeah, but there was another one. Right, Alicia? question is what do we learn from jesus that will help us fulfill our responsibilities to god as his children what do we learn from jesus that will help us Fulfill our responsibilities to God as his children. It's not asking us what is our responsibilities to God. What are our responsibilities to God as his children? Rather, what is it that Jesus, what example, what quality does Jesus teach us through his life? that helps us as we strive to fulfill our responsibilities, just like Jesus did. And what we see then... is that Jesus was 100% dedicated to the will of God. As we see in verse 27, actually in verse 28, what shall I say? Shall, shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause I came I unto this hour. And then he turns and he says, Father, glorify thy name. He then says, in talking about being the light, while you have light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. But specifically in 44 through 50, Jesus puts forth this. He says, if you look on me, you're looking on God. Verse 44 and following, Alicia. See that? He believeth on me, believe not on me, but on him that sent me. He that sees me, seeth him that sent me. I came a light in the world that uh, whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. He that rejecteth me not uh, reject and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in that last day. Well, what words is it, Jesus? I have not spoken of myself. but I have spoken the words that God gave me to speak. So in other words, if you're not, if you reject my words, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting God. 
verse 49 and 50. Jesus was a hundred percent dedicated to obedience to the will of God. What is it we can learn from Jesus that will help us fulfill our responsibilities to God as his children? Be 100% dedicated to God. Paul put it this way. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, yet the, or, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul was 100% dedicated to the will of God because Jesus was his master and had provided that example. And Paul followed Jesus to the point where he let Jesus live through him, plain and simple. Plain and simple. If we were to know how we died or how we were going to die, would it change how we lived? And uh, while we're on that same question, if we were to know how we were to die, Would it change our dedication to God? You see, many, many people every day are given a death sentence. A lot of people have bucket lists, they call them, a list of things they want to do before they kick the bucket. Does it change how they live? A lot of them. If a doctor comes to you and gives you the diagnosis of cancer. You've got two weeks left to live. How does that change your perspective? Your life? And yet Jesus has said... Uh, you know, as you think about this, Jesus knew when his life was going to end. Jesus knew how his life was going to end before he even left heaven to become a man. And it was the most excruciating and painful way to end his life. Also, Jesus has told us, we, he says, you don't know when the Lord, when I am coming back, even I don't know when I'm coming back. Be watchful. I don't, I, 
I don't know. But a lot of times, I, w I would hazard a, a guess that you are like me, and you and I get wrapped up in our day-to-day -day life to where we don't think that this could be our last second on this earth. But we need to. We need to. What do we learn about from Jesus that will help us fulfill our responsibilities to God as his children? Be 100% dedicated to the will of God. Yes, Sam says it was written to about his life to explain before he even set foot on earth. It was his purpose. Teresa says, well, I would think my family would obey the gospel, but I have seen so many of my family go through stuff that don't even change them. Unfortunately, I cannot control what another person does how another person responds. But I can control how I respond. And Jesus doesn't say, go out there and, and, and make them fear or make them live a certain way. He just simply says, teach. And you, be watchful. Let's put three minutes on the clock. As we let's put three minutes on the clock as we record our answers to these three questions. You wayward tech person, get back with the program. Or you shall uh, seriously be regretting not being with the program. As I go through the kitchen cupboards and find more dishes for you to do. Question number one, write down one question or observation you have over this uh, chapter. Write down one question or observation you have over this chapter. Question number two, list one way this chapter will strengthen your commitment to God. List one way this 
chapter will strengthen your commitment to God. Question number three, write out one action step you will take in your life based on today's reading. Begin your answer with, I will. Question number three. Well, I'm glad you didn't. Well, Sister T, let me repeat the, uh, the words of a famous Bible character. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> More than likely he is asleep, but then again, he could be out walking the dogs. Or he could be washing dishes. <laughs> ah, but in this regard, Sam, I am not my brother's keeper. He lives in Michigan. I am in Iowa. I don't know where he's at. I said, I don't know what he's doing. All right. Question number one was write down one question or observation you have over this chapter. And our first answer comes from Sister T. And she says verses seven and eight. So Alyssa is going to take us up there. Seven says, Jesus said, let her alone. It's against the day of my burying. She has kept this. For the poor are you always you have with you, but me you not have not always. Question 
it's it's um quite the the quite the account here We have a record of two Marys, uh, if I remember correctly. There is Mary here, the brother of, or rather the sister of Lazarus, who washed Jesus' feet with this precious ointment. And wiped his feet with her hair. And then there is the, I believe it was Mary Magdalene. There was, there was a Mary with whom he had cast out seven devils. And I don't remember, I, I guess I should, uh, I should look that up. Um... If there was a Mary who had, he, whom he had cast out seven devils, um, she cried and wiped her his hair with or his feet with her hair, and then there was this Mary with the special ointment, and I, it could be the same one, it could be different. I'd have to go look. Anyhow, um. But yeah, that was rather weird, wasn't it, Tiger? Um, Jesus says when 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 Judas verbally chastises her. Why wasn't this sold and then the proceeds given to the poor? Well, Jesus cuts right to the heart of the matter. He says, Leave her alone. She's kept this against the day of my burying. You have the poor with you always, but you don't always have me. Leave her alone. He knew that Judas didn't care one bit for the poor. Judas was only interested in his own pocket. But not so for, for uh, Mary. Jesus had said, you're going to have all, you're always going to have wars and rumors of war, you're always going to have natural disasters, you're always going to have the poor, but you don't always have me. And he said that to the disciples. Then he ascended. After his resurrection, you know, then he was crucified, buried, and resurrected then, and then he ascended. And he promised before he ascended, though, he promised the disciples that he would be with them, with us, even to the end of the world. Whether we're rich or poor, whether we're well or sick, whether we're going through hard times or good times. Jesus is with us. Answer number two. Heather says to reject the word of God is to reject God. And we find that at the very bottom of the, in, in verse 49 and 50 of the chapter. 
For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Wait a minute, Jesus. Does that mean that when you said you were the door and no man comes, no man can enter in but by you? That God said you were the door? The Father said that you were the door? Yes, child, that's exactly what it means. So you're telling me, Jesus, that when you say you're the way and the truth and the life, no man can come to the Father but by you, that God said that you are going to be the only way unto him? Yes, child, that's exactly what it means. All right, now, bear with me. Let me see if I got this right, Jesus. When you said that all authority has been granted unto you in heaven and earth, that God said that you have all authority in heaven and in earth? Yes, child. That's exactly what... God said. So when you say that belief and baptism are required to be saved, then God said belief and baptism were required. Yes, child. That's exactly what God said. And if we reject that, we are rejecting God. Answer number three. Jesus came to die for our sin and tell us how to draw close to the Father and him and that Jesus dying, he was going to draw all to him. Everybody has the same opportunity to look unto Jesus, to go unto Jesus, to, to follow Christ. Every person has the same opportunity To be a disciple of Christ. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men unto me. God, through Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Micah, and Daniel, prophesied that all nations were going to flow unto the kingdom and the king answer number four okay question number two then list one way this chapter will strengthen your commitment to God is that number one Heather says, knowing that I will be judged by God's word will help me be more diligent in my study of it. Jesus said, the word which I spake will judge. How, how does Jesus' word? Let's go back and look at that one there. Verse forty. 
Um, seven. Alicia? And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to the world to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, verse 48, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I spake judgeth him, I shall judge him in the last day. Why is it that the word that Jesus spake is going to judge us in the last day? Because Jesus spake not his own words, but the Father. So the Father will judge, yeah, judge in the last day. The standard is the words that Jesus spake. If you do not receive the words that Jesus spake, If you reject those words, God will judge you. Jesus is saying there that not that he's not going to be the judge. but that he wasn't the judge at that time. Jesus is saying that his words are the words of his father. And since you are rejecting Jesus and his message, you are really rejecting the father. Backing up to verse 44, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but rather on him that sent me. He that seeth me doesn't see me, but sees the one that sent me. Verse 45. In other words, I'm just the messenger. What you're really doing is hearing God's word and hearing and, and seeing God. So yes, knowing that I'm going to be judged by God's word should help us be more diligent in our study of it. 2 Timothy 2.15, answer number three. Knowing that I serve a risen Savior and God himself 100% as my example. It will strengthen my commitment to God. This chapter, though, is not about the risen Savior. This chapter, of course, is about Jesus being 100% dedicated to God's will. While he lived before he was crucified. And as we see. Then our example should indeed. Uh, strengthen our commitment to God. Because if our example. If our master. The disciple is never above the master. But if our master was 100% devoted to God and his will, should we not also? Should we not also? Is there another answer, Alicia? Verse 25 and 6. 
Mm, take us up there. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that loveth and hateth his life uh, in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Jesus really nails everything down. Um, first off, if you're going to serve me, serve me. You're going to serve me, you're going to be found wherever I'm, wherever I will be. Secondly, if you love your life in this world, you're going to lose it. In eternity. But you, but if you hate your, if you love your life less in this life, in this world, than me, if you love your life, if you love, uh, yes, if you love less your life in this world, you're going to receive life eternal. It goes with the same concept of him putting this, of a person putting their hand to the plow and looking back. They're not going to be fit for the kingdom of heaven. Do we want to stay in this world? Then perhaps we should look at our priorities. Is Jesus really our master? Or should I say we should work on our priorities? Because Jesus says we need to love this life less than we love him. We have to also, Sam, realize that these are separate events. You and I read them through, and we read them almost as if they're one thing, but this is the life of Christ. We are talking about a different event. We're talking several weeks or so, even perhaps a, um, a different year than what we um, what we witnessed in in eleven. Yes, Jesus said, "I am the resurrection and the life," but sometime later he comes back to Bethany but I don't I don't see what that has to do with what we're talking about Forgive me for being dense. I, I want to try to understand the point you're trying to make, Sam.
when we look at this chapter, we look at the chat and we need to um, ask ourselves, uh, it, when we look at the question and the chapter together, list one way this chapter will strengthen our your commitment to God. And we're following Christ. We are the disciples of Christ. We, that's why we bear the name Christian. Christian used to be a derogatory, initially began as a derogatory name, but the Christians actually adopted it as a holy name. Um, was it Peter or was it Paul that said, why they blaspheme that holy name by which you are called? Um, and so when we look at Christ then in this chapter, how does his example help our life, our commitment to God? How does it strengthen our commitment to God? Now, our commitment can be strengthened via um, believing in the works that they've done. Sorry, you forgot your hat. Um, some of it is our, our commitment to God can be strengthened through the the miracles that were be, being done it can be strengthened because of the message that jesus is carrying or that the writer is carrying and it can be strengthened via the example that's being set and what we have here is jesus's message and example being together bringing coming together to show us his 100 percent dedication to god yes he was ready to suffer for us he was a hundred percent committed to the will of god and we ourselves need to be like Christ. So we can take this message and we can take the example that Jesus sets and say, I want to be like him. And I'm going to turn around, I'm going to look at my life through the, the lens of this example. Okay? Is my life a hundred percent dedicated to the will of God. If not, how is it not? How can I make that better? How can I strengthen that? Another idea is the fact that Jesus sought not his own personal gain, but the glory of God. How can I, in my life, turn my actions and my speech so that they are uh, constantly, consistently promoting the will of God? glorifying promoting the glory of god jesus said as we read in verse 45 he that seeth me seeth him that sent me how do we let god 
shine forth from our life. And we need to look at our life through these lenses and ask ourselves these tough questions. And they are tough because you know your life and you know where it needs working. Question number three. Question number three, Alicia. Alicia Marie, why is that door shut contrary to your mother's instructions? Don't play innocent with me, my dear. Write out your action step. Sister T says, I will always strive to keep my eyes on God. And ultimately, that's what we need to do um, in order to remain 100% committed to God's will. Keep our eyes on God. There is no try in the Christian life. There's do or do not. Jesus says, he that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. When you are plowing, you don't look back. You keep your eyes forward. You put a, you have a point on the horizon that you just, you keep your horse steering toward or your tractor. You don't look back, you go forward. You keep your eyes on that line, that point, and you go toward it without wavering. Otherwise, you're going to, you're going to plow in a crooked furrow. And trust me, when you say, when you plow a crooked furrow, it is not easy to straighten it out. Jesus says, there's no try. There's do. Heather says, I will seek to bring more glory to God by conforming my life to God's will. Philippians chapter 2. When I pour out my life to be filled with this this year. For I want to know Christ and the power of his rising, sharing his suffering, being conformed to his death. Philippians 2. Philippians 3, verse 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Philippians 3, verse 10. Sam says, I will not live like the world. I will walk in the light so I can have the Father and the Son with me so I can be saved and reign with him. Isn't it interesting that Father, God is called the fountain of life, or light rather. And yet we go in verse 7 of First John Chapter 1 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Did you catch that? 
God is the fountain of light. God the Father is the fountain of light. But Jesus is the light. Did you get that? Did you catch that? For it says, if we walk in the light as he, who's the he? Well, obviously, if his son, if we're talking about his son, in verse 5, it says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. Whose son? The father's. I love you too, Sam. See, in that regard, Sam, I'm being my brother's keeper, am I not? Jesus said, I am the light. God is light. In him is no darkness. There's no turning. There's no variableness. Yet God the Father is the fountain of light. So if we walk in the light, if we walk in Christ, as he is in the light, We have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And I'm going to leave you with that one this morning. Let's walk in the light of Christ. Let's follow his example of being 100% devoted to doing the will of God to letting the glory of God shine forth, to speaking the word of God and only the word of God. Bow with me. Our Father, God in heaven, we come before your throne this day, thanking you for another day of life. We thank you for the light that is your son and the example that he set while he walked this earth. Father, we pray that as we meditate upon the words of John chapter 12, that we may incorporate them into our life, being 100% devoted to you and your will. May we let you live in us, reign in our life supreme, and shine forth. Father, may you be glorified through our life this day. Help us to humbly submit ourselves unto your will and resist our enemy, the devil. Grant unto your servants strength that we may overcome. Father, we pray for wisdom, for guidance from you. We pray for strength and courage. And please, Father, teach us what to say, how to say it, and when to say it, that in all things, your glory and your will may be done on this earth as it is in heaven. This, our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for being here, and we pray that you have been edified through our time th this morning. Remember also, uh, brethren, to add to our faith devotion. I'll see you then. God bless.